book of Esther. We just, uh, this was our part of our Bible reading last week, and you've probably heard in your lifetime a lot of messages on the book of Esther, and I'm going to try to, Lord willing, we're going to go through the whole book of Esther, but don't get scared about that. But a little bit different because usually the story is about Queen Esther, and we talk a lot about her, and uh, and really that's not going to be the focus at all tonight. We are going to go through the book of Esther, but I'm more focusing on uh, laws as they pertain to God's people. And so the title of the message tonight is The Law of the Medes. In the Persians, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit, the laws as they affect uh, uh, God's people, the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Now, you've probably heard this before. There are two books in the Bible that don't mention the word God or any, anything along those lines, uh, and one is the book of Esther, and as a result, it's had some criticism over the years. People, Some even tried to say it wasn't supposed to be part of the canon or whatever. Anybody want to guess what the other book is? Song of Solomon, yeah, so those don't have anything to say about God, and some people say, well, why would God's word that he inspired leave out anything about God? Well, but the thing about Esther is this, I mean, we can talk about Song of Solomon another day, but the thing about Esther is the whole thing is dealing with God's people, and very much uh, applies, you know, not just to God's people in those days, to the Jews, but to Christians in general and how God will deal with his people. And if they keep living for him, he'll get them through trying times and, and all this kind of stuff. There's great application. And, of course, the Jews during that time, uh, having already read through Chronicles, if you're following your Bible in, chron in order as, as we have it, all through chron Chronicle, you know, you went through Kings and then Chronicles, then you read Esther. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, where they're back, they're going back into the land, right? Uh, they were in captivity. Of course, Wednesday nights we're going through Ezekiel. I know that's not in order, but the prophets are are lumped in a different part of the Bible. But those prophets, you know, they they fit into the this order as well. So so the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Daniel, those were all taking place during that time when they were in captivity. Ezra and Nehemiah, they go back into the land, but not all of them. Remember, God promises in Ezekiel, he said, I'm going to scatter them. They're going to, all those who are left are going to be scattered. Right? And so some went back into the land, like Isaiah prophesied to King Cyrus. He listed them by name many years before that actually happened, which some have said, oh, Isaiah can't be, it can't, couldn't have really been written when it claims to be written because nobody could have prophesied the king that was going to set them free or whatever that many years before. Well, yeah, God made a lot of prophecies in the Bible that later on came to pass. <laughs> so it shouldn't surprise us that God did that. And so, uh, and so that's the case. So now most of them, are, or, or I should say a lot of the, those who are remaining have went back into the land, as you read in Ezra. Then Nehemiah talked a little bit about uh, that same time period. And now we're in Esther, and, and Mordecai and his, actually his cousin that he made his daughter, all right? So she, he must have been a lot older than her, took her as his daughter. That's Queen Esther, okay? Mordecai is a Jew. Well, they're not, they didn't go back into the land. So they're in Shushan, which is this place under the empire of a king named Ahasuerus. Look at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, uh, this is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. So just think about that. If you're familiar at all with uh, geography, I'm not great at it, but uh, the Middle East there, where most of what happens in the Bible takes place, is right there between Africa and uh, what you would think of, you know, uh, uh, the eastern Russia, Turkey, all those kind of places. And so Babylon is up there with, Tur with Turkey and all that. But now if you go from India, you know, which is kind of beyond that, that would be kind of far east. And then you go all the way to, into Africa, into Ethiopia. You're talking about a huge empire that this king is reigning. 
And just as Daniel had prophesied in that great image that we remember so, so well, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the image with the gold head and, uh, and the, the silver, I always get it all mixed up, the silver arms. Well, two arms, that was going to be the next empire to replace that golden head empire, which represented Babylon. And the next part of the body has two arms, which represented the Medes and the Persians. Okay, so, the, so Media and Persia, these are, are the main places that now rule the, the, the world as they knew it uh, in that place. Okay, and so here's what we're talking about. And this phrase comes up, uh, in fact, at the end of Esther, uh, we see what's called Purim. Or it's also called the Feast of Lots. And so to this day, Jews celebrate this feast, uh, Purim, remembering what took place during this time of, of Esther and how they were delivered from the wicked Haman that tried to kill all the Jews and, and, and what have you. So anyway, it's a great book, and I hope you read it. I, there's no way I can actually go through all ten chapters, I believe it is, and uh, and really give a thorough you know, disposition on what all happens, but we're going to go through just a few things as it relates to this law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, how many have heard that phrase before? The law of the Medes and Persians, right? And so, uh, uh, usually, when somebody says that, what they mean is not so much a specific law, but what they mean is a law that's unbinding. I mean, that's that's binding. That's uh, that cannot be broken. It's immutable, right? This law will stand. So maybe a Maybe a parent said, hey, I'm going to lay down the law here. It's going to be like the law of the Medes and the Persians, right? Which means it can't be altered. And so several times in, in this passage of Scripture, in Esther, uh, we find this uh, about this type of law. And what it is is, you know, people might come to the king and say, hey, I got this idea, king. Here's a law that will be in your favor. And they talk him into it. And so he says, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Writes the law, seals it with his ring. And it says, this law cannot be altered. You cannot break it. Even the king himself can't change it. Once he's sealed it, that, so with the Medes and the Persians, this is just the way they, they operated. Now, most people, if you say, if you look up, you know, what is the Medes and the Persians, what the law of the Medes and the Persians, they'll take you to Daniel. So we're coming back to Esther, of course, but let's look back, uh, look forward a little bit to Daniel. All right. Right after Ezekiel. And Daniel 6 is one place a lot of people go to when they talk about this law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, Daniel 6, you'll recognize the story uh, where they talk, the, the princes of the land talk the king Darius, all right? So, same time frame. The beginning of Daniel, Daniel is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, right? That's under the Babylonian Empire. But then later on, he's talking about King Darius. King Darius came in with the Medes and the Persians and now is ruling over that area where Daniel is. Okay, so now he's dealing with that king. And if you remember, he likes Daniel. But then, and the Medes and the Persians had a great relationship with the Jews. But, but all these princes of the land don't like him. And they think the only way we can get him, and mainly they didn't like him because the king liked him. But they said the only way we can get him is by the way he worships his God. And so they talked the king into saying, hey, this guy, you know, he's praying to a god that is uh, contrary to the gods that we serve or whatever. And they, they trip him up and they say, uh, make this law that nobody can worship any god except for, uh, for you and our gods. So he ignorantly, you know, just as so many of those kings apparently seem to do, he's talked into this. And he writes down that they can't do that. He seals it. And then Daniel, of course, prays anyway. And he goes before his window, opens it up, and he prays. And sure enough, because of the law that King Darius had made, he has to get thrown into the lion's den. Okay, you remember and all that stuff. So here we go, Daniel chapter 6, look at verse 8. I started talking and stopped turning. Uh, let's start with verse 8 there. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Uh, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knee three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. 
And these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. So you get the idea there. You know, they, when they made this law during that kingdom, uh, you know, king Ahas, whether it's King Darius, King Ahasuerus, whatever, uh, if they made the law and they sealed it, it was binding. There's no, no it couldn't be uh, broken. And so obviously, I'm getting ahead of myself, but obviously a lot of laws would, would rise up, you know, all these different laws. And then somebody would have to go through the book and say, hey, isn't there a law about this thing? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's what happens when you start making all these laws, right? Then you got this, who's going to, you're going to have to see a lawyer because we don't even know what the laws are. There's so many of them, right? So anyway, now let's go back to Esther. And so we see then, again, laws being made. And the first thing we see in chapter 1, the first law that is made is this. King Ahasuerus has a wife, Vashti, all right? And apparently she's very beautiful. And so he's making this feast. I mean, he's got all the princes in the kingdom. They're coming. It's a, this long, super long, like half a year uh, type feast. And at the end of it, he has a, just a great big feast where everybody's invited. And then and they're drinking and all this kind of stuff. And then he says, hey, uh, all the guys are like, hey, bring Vashti so that we can look at her. He's wanting to show her off. And so he commands that somebody brings Vashti, his wife. Because she's over at another banqueting part with the ladies. And so Vashti says, no, I'm not coming. And you know what's funny is I've actually read commentaries where they praise Vashti. And they say, yeah, that's what, she shouldn't have gone. And they say that, you know, he, was, he wanted to see her, you know, without clothes. And so she should have stood her ground and said, there's actually nothing in the scripture that says that. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But when I read this, that's not what I see. I just see simply she's with all the ladies. And King Ahasuerus says, you know, hey, go get Vashti. Tell her to come here. And she says, in front of the ladies, hey, watch this. Tell him no. <gasps> you told the king no? What's going on? And so let's see how, uh, how uh, bold the king is now. He goes to all, his, all of his guy friends and says, what should I do? <laughs> she told me no. <laughs> right? And so look at uh, verse 9. Also Vashti... The queen made a, I know I'm already telling you guys this, but that's the way whenever I read it, it makes more sense to you. Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belongeth to the king Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha. A lot of great names, aren't they? Zephar, this is my favorite one, a carcass. Can you imagine someone with the name Carcass? Hey, well, how you doing, uh, uh, Cadaver? Oh, I mean Carcass. <laughs> how you doing, Roadkill? <laughs> carcass. Anyway, so, so. And <laughs> so don't name your kid Carcass. And seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and all, all the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But... The queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that uh, knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, uh, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Parsina, and Memukin. And the seven princes of, of, the Persia, of Persia and Media, which uh, when the king, when saw the king's face and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. And Mamukin answered before the king and the, of the, and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, 
so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, and, and, it, is, and it shall be reported the king of Hesher has commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in unto him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of the Persian and Media say this day unto all the kings and princes which have heard the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise uh, too much contempt and wrath. And so here's what he's saying. They're saying, hey, this doesn't just affect you. If you let her get away with this, all the women are going to start saying, no, I don't have to obey you. <laughs> and so he said, make a decree to set this thing right. You know, you, you, we don't want all of our women rising up against us <laughs> telling us that's just what they're saying, okay? Verse 19, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she and when the king's decree, which, has, uh, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all the empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mamukin. Now, first, one, first th point that I want to make is this. There are going to be laws... Again, we're talking about laws as they relate to God's people, right? There are going to be laws in our country that are made that are actually in accord with biblical principles. Now, look, should he have divorced Vashti and did all this kind of stuff? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying as a, as a Jewish person in that day, you know, had, having been under the laws of, uh, you know, the Old Testament and what have you, as they would hear this decree and say, hey, that's it. You know, I'm going to make this law and we're going to make sure all the wives out there know that they need to submit to their husbands and, be, and honor them and what have you. To the Jew, they would have been like, so that's already an understood thing. I mean, that's already how we live. That's all, already how we do it. And, uh, and so this goes back to Genesis 3.16. Turn there real quickly, if you will. I don't, make a, I don't want to make a huge deal out of this one law, but the principle is that some laws, and I'm making the application to Christians here, some laws, they won't really affect us that much as Christians whenever they're made because we already agree, you know, we shouldn't kill, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't do all these things, for instance, right? But what about this one? It is worth mentioning. Genesis 3.16 is where... God is handing out punishments to those uh, in the garden because of the fall. So Eve gets her punishment for committing the sin. Adam gets his punishment for following her example and, and, and eating of the forbidden fruit as well. And then Satan will get his punishment, you know, for tempting Eve. And, and so that's what we have. So verse 16 is Eve's punishment, if you will. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy des desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You say, well, that's just not fair of God. Hey, I, I don't write the book. I'm the preacher. I just tell you what the book says. And so that's what it says. Now, th this isn't the day to get into like how husbands are supposed to treat their wives and how wives are supposed to treat their husbands. That's not my point. But the principle of wives honoring and, uh, and submitting to their husbands is all throughout the Bible. Let's go to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5. Actually, I'll read these to you, okay? Ephesians 5, 22. I mean, you can mark it down or turn there if you want, but it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. All right. Uh, Colossians 3.18, kind of a parallel passage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And so what's really amazing to me is that this one uh, principle, which is a Bible principle, is in our society today so rejected. And so uh, they just don't, they, they resist that and, they, and they, they hate that. And so to the point, you know, there are other things that I'll get to in a minute, but to the point where uh, they will try to trip you up. And, and let me explain. So we've got a church website. And on that website, people can comment in various ways. And uh, here in the last... I would say six months to probably six months. I've received a whole lot more comments on our website than ever before. 
because the name of the, of the church through, well, for instance, a lot of our visitors say, hey, how'd you hear about the church? Hey, I was typing online, independent fundamental Baptist churches, and your church came up. We have a, the presence has been online long enough, and enough stuff has been uploaded that it comes up quite a bit more, okay? And so as a result of that, people who want to criticize churches or try to trip them up or try to get them caught in saying something so that they can say, hey, look what this guy said, you know, that's increasing. And so I get emails all the time. Sometimes I don't answer them because they're, they're so stupid. And sometimes I will try to answer them in a, as polite as I can type of way. They almost always have to do with the issue of homosexuality, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, or some other kind of like a, uh, abuse of power. A lot of people think independent Baptists are just, you know, they're power hungry and you make your wife submit to you and do everything. And I, that's not quite how it is. But if I'm honest, is, is the husband the head of the household? Do I believe that? Yes. If I were to say, well, it's not exactly like that, I would just be a coward because that's what the Bible says. And so a preacher ought to say, yeah, according to the Bible, the man is the head of the household. Now, he has responsibilities towards his wife, but his wife's responsibility is to follow his authority and to honor him and, and respect him as the head. It makes his job easier, makes the whole household function better if everybody just kind of falls in place and, pl and, pl and uh, plays their position, as you will. Preached a whole series on that <laughs> when I became the pastor here. And so why would you want to emphasize that? Why would you want to even talk about that? Why would you want to bring that up? Because anything that the world hates about the Bible, if we are just quiet about it, guess who wins? The world wins, right? They, uh, who cares about the Bible? Well, we conquered that one. It's like Satan gets a little victory. Yeah, well, you know, they're not talking about that one anymore. And the Word of God gets watered down, and churches and the preaching gets watered down because nobody will stand up and talk about clear, clear things in the Bible. Okay, so when a law, and you're not going to find a law like this in our land, but <laughs> when a law is made that would say, you know, hey, the husband is the head of the household, right? That doesn't really affect us as Christians because we say, yeah, well, that's already, uh, that's already in the Bible. And again, that's not going to be in our law. We realize that. But in this time, what I'm just reading, that was a good example. We might have examples in our society, and I think we do. I mean, there are a lot of laws that they kind of you say, hey, they must have got that law out of the Bible because we, we believe that. You know, there's a law in the Bible that says if you dig a hole and someone else, uh, uh, someone else falls into it, right, then you're kind of held responsible for that. And, well, that's, a, that's biblical. You know, if you, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into all these Old Testament laws, but there's a lot of laws that you're like, well, that lines up exactly with the Bible, so that doesn't affect me at all, okay? So, uh, so that's the first kind of law that we see here in Esther, and it's a good application for us, laws that we will see in our land. The problem is when, here's the problem with the law of the Medes and Persians. When we start thinking that we need to micromanage, you know, and make more laws, and that's what I see in our society that drives me crazy. And a good example of this is, and I don't know how you feel about seatbelts, and so I'm not trying to start a debate or anything like that. But I think seatbelts is a perfect example. And car seats and all you got to, you got to be so many pounds and ounces before you ha can get, stop wearing your, uh, get out of your car seat. And you, you have to have a seatbelt. Oh, but it has to be, ex and I, maybe they're making all those laws for our safety. But one law leads to another law. And then you say, well, that's not right. So you need to add another law. And then before you know it, it's like, did I break the law? I don't even know. Well, let me show you what the book says. And you got to, it's on article 56432. And you're, you're like, what in the world, right? Well, that's how it was with the law of the Medes and Persians. It's like everything is binding, but it's like, oh, well, we'll just write another law to counter that law. We'll just write an, uh, another law. No, we ought to do this. And as Christians, we should understand this principle too. I like how the Bible says, he that uh, walks in the spirit is not under the law, right? So we have some basic principles. Hey, you love, the, love God with all your heart. Right? And love others. Put, put others above yourself even. And if you do that, you're not going to steal. You're not going to murder. You're not going to, right? Because you love the Lord, you love people. And these are the common things if you're, you know, you're just walking in the spirit. And I understand the world doesn't understand that. They can't, they're carnal and they can't understand the, the word of God. But a basic principle when it comes to law, I think, should be, hey, we just, we just judge uh, according to behavior, Right? We don't have to know all the ins and outs about why they did what they did. 
you know, I don't need to know if somebody was swerving on the road and a police officer pulled him over, does he really have to find out if they were on their cell phone or if they were drinking or they're they're doing this or that? They were swerving. They were breaking. They were driving recklessly. Let's say, hey, they were driving recklessly. I don't know what the reason was, but they were driving recklessly. I, I, but then I realized it's the lawyers to get involved and all this kind of stuff. But you see what I'm saying? Laws, when they start getting into micromanaging, hey, you got all these kinds of problems. I just thought I'd throw that, <laughs> throw that in there. It has nothing to do with the message. But anyway, uh, and we see, we see a lot of things. But okay, here are some examples of, of laws that aren't necessary but as a Christian, I'm like, yeah, I don't mind that. And here, here's an example. Laws regarding alcohol and drinking. You know, well, I, I'm, I don't drink, and I don't think anybody should drink. So make all the laws you want. You know, <laughs> you can't drink and drive. Well, of course you can't drink and drive. I remember taking a driving test, and Zachary probably had to deal with this here recently. You're taking a driving test, and you're filling out all the answers, and all of a sudden ask you about, like, what percentage of alcohol do you have to be legally blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm not going to drink. So it doesn't apply to me, right? But you have to know that, that answer. But, uh, but look, if they make all these laws against, you know, we could live. I'm not, I'm not saying we need to get back to the prohibition. But if, if America just had this revival and said, hey, we hate alcohol, we're going to go back to the prohibition. No one's allowed to make or sell alcohol. That's fine with me. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't affect me one bit because I think you shouldn't even look on this stuff whenever it uh, moves itself aright and it's fermented. And so anyway, so there are some laws that we as Christians are going to have in our land that don't affect us. In fact, we say, hey, I'm not necessarily for that. I'm not necessarily for more laws or whatever, but it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. In fact, it kind of helps promote a biblical principle, okay? But sometimes we are going to see, and it's increasing more than ever, I believe, laws that go against biblical principles. Look at chapter 2. All right. Second point would be a little bit shorter. Third point would be even shorter yet. So uh, Esther chapter 2, look at verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, uh, he remembered Vashti. Uh, let me see here. Do I want to go there? Yeah, okay. Uh, he remembered Vashti and what she had done. No, I don't think this is where I want to be. Okay, so as the story goes on, let me, uh, let me go on. It starts introducing these characters, and it introduced Mordecai. And then there is, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be chapter 3, I'm sorry. So then we meet this guy named Haman, and Haman gets promoted, and he's really just, you can see that he just loves authority. He wants honor and reverence from everybody, okay? So chapter 3, verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamaditha, uh, the Agagite, and advanced him and sat his seat above all the princes that were with him. And I'm telling you, this really went to his head. You see this throughout the rest of the book where he's like, hey, who could, the, who could be honored more than me? I mean, look, I'm the top in the land. You know, I get to go in uh, to the banquet house with Esther and the king, and, and he thinks he is just somebody, right? And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandments? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai, uh, 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 Mordecai matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Uh, and he thought scorn to lay hand on Mordecai alone, for they had uh, uh, showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of the Hasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So he just, this went to his head. He really wanted to persecute Mordecai and all Mordecai's family and everybody who was a Jew because of this one thing. All the other people were following the king's law. Now, it doesn't say that this was of the law of the Medes and Persians and that he sealed it with his ring. I'll, I'll give you that. But it does say that this was a commandment of the king. And it does show that people were asking, hey, why are you going against the king's commandment? We're supposed to be bowing whenever he comes by. And they're looking at Mordecai and he's like, I'm not going to bow. 
Now, really, from what I understand, there's nothing in the Old Testament that actually says you can't bow in reverence to somebody in particular. I don't know if it's the implication that, hey, he was wanting this reverence like he was a god, or if, you know, I don't know what all the details were, but I know that Mordecai's stand was this. I would be sinning against God if I bowed to this man, and I'm not going to bow to him. And they say, hey, but it's the king's law. You know, remember the law of the Medes and the Persians, it's unbinding, it's unalterable. You've got to bow. Well, it reminds me of Daniel. It reminds me of Mad, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've got to bow to this thing. And they say, hey, I'm not careful to answer you, king. <laughs> I, lo I love that line. We're not careful to answer you. You can do whatever you want to us. We're not going to bow, right? Well, it was the law. And here's what some Christians will say today. They'll say, hey, if the government makes the law, we're supposed to honor the king. We're supposed to do what the king says. Yeah, they're taking some verses out of context, number one. Number two, they don't realize that there is a time where we say, look, I'm respecting those in authority over me. I'm going to do everything I can to honor them. If it's not going against the Bible, I'll obey the law. If the law says, now, I'm not saying I've never broken this law, <laughs> but if the law says I'm not supposed to speed or I'm supposed to wear my seatbelt, that doesn't go against the Bible. I'm going to do it, right? Then I'm supposed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but sometimes I forget, or, or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with obey. We should obey laws that aren't going against God, God's word. But what if something tell? What if there was a, an authority figure that tells us to do something that God told us not to do, or tells us not to do something that God told us to do? Who's the higher authority? God's the higher authority. And I would say this about my kids, for instance. If I told my kids to do something, the Bible says, honor your mother and father, right? You need to obey your mother and father. But if I told them to do something and they saw in the Bible that it said, whoa, the Bible tells me not to do that. I would hope they would have first at least come to me and say, dad, you really want me to do that because the Bible says not, you see what I'm saying? But if I said, I don't care what the Bible says, you're going to do that. I would expect them to say, you know, God's a greater authority than you, dad. And you might say, oh, I can't believe. Well, see, then if, if that's your feeling on the matter, then you haven't realized yet that God's word is what matters more than anything. And so if God's word said, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. I thank the Lord. What we get accused of believing that the Bible says, you know, it doesn't say. You know, a lot of people say, hey, you believe the Bible says, you know, you ought to stone kids, you know, that, <laughs> that disobey or whatever. Well, that's not exactly what it says. All right. And I thank the Lord for that. But what if the Bible did say, hey, if my kid cusses me, I'm supposed to stone him with stones? I mean, if it said that, and I believe with all my heart that's what it said, I wouldn't be wrong in doing it. Now, that's hard to say because you're already thinking, whoa, I mean, <laughs> at some point we've got to draw the line. Well, thankfully, this is the Word of God, and it's not going to tell us to do something that is unethical or, or wrong, okay, because God makes the rules. All right, but what I'm saying is we've got to get to this point to where we read the Word of God as if to say, show me where my thinking might be wrong, and you're right. And then we do that. And why is that important? Well, because there are laws that are made uh, that go against biblical principles. Now, if someone makes a law you know, about drinking, it doesn't affect many anything. You know, I'm not... Uh, you know, I don't care really. I, I do care because it affects me, but as far as this marijuana, everybody's legalizing marijuana in every state, right? And it does affect me to some degree, but you know what? They can make all the laws against it or for it or whatever. I'm not going to do it, so it doesn't really matter. I, you, know, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm just talking about in the sense of, of, of how, it, how it affects me, right? Again, a secondary effect, I understand that. Colorado is a good example of that, but anyway. And so, uh, uh, so, but there are laws where I will say, no, I will not do that. What you're saying for me to do affects my relationship with God, and I can't do it, okay? And so it would be like if a law said, you must drink alcohol, you must uh, smoke marijuana, you know, you must do this. Then I would say, no, no, I don't have to. You know, you can j take me to jail, whatever you want, but I'm going to stick with the Bible. Okay, so... In this case, a law was made that said, hey, when this guy Haman walks down the road, y'all got to bow down to him. And Mordecai said, no, I don't. He said, oh, what a rebel. Well, I don't know if he was rebellious or not, but the fact is he, feel, he felt like God was his authority more than Mordecai. And as Christians, it's okay for us to say, 
What God has to say is more important than what the government says, what my teacher says if you're in school, what my, what my parents say, wives, what my husband says. Now, don't use that and uh, <laughs> to go too far. Say, yeah, I don't, think that, uh, I don't think that God would want that, and so, you know, I'm going to divorce you or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying God is the ultimate authority that we have to obey. Okay, so here are some examples of people who have to disobey laws. I just heard a great story today. I'm trying to think. I, I think somebody shared a message online, and I listened to a little clip of a message or whatever, and this guy was talking about the persecuted churches in uh, China. If you never read about some of those uh, experiences, I, I was talking about that, and then Zachary was actually telling me about something he read uh, along similar similar lines. In China, they cannot assemble like we're assembling here. All right, I think everybody knows that. So they're very much in hiding. You know, I heard that they would go, you know, they rent a building. A lot of their buildings are up high. And so they rent a building on the top floor. They'd have to go up, you know, one or two at a time so they don't attract attention to themselves, right? So they can go very secretly. And then they go in there and they met. And this preacher said he was there to, to deliver a message to him. And he, and, and he said, how many of you guys have been uh, persecuted for your faith. You've been thrown in jail or something like that. And like, you know, probably 75% of them raise their hand. They've been thrown in jail already once or twice for either preaching or assembling together or whatever. And he said, man, that's just such a shame. And so he had brought some Bibles, smuggled some Bibles, and he gave out, he didn't have enough for everybody, but he gave out as many Bibles as he could. And he began to uh, uh, say, hey, turn to uh, 2 Timothy 4, right? And all of a sudden, some of the people handed their Bibles to some of the other people. And, uh, and then he said, I don't know why they handed their Bibles off, but that's okay. And then he started to read that, script, that passage of Scripture, and he noticed that all those people were quote, that had passed their Bible off were quoting it. They already had it memorized. And so he asked a little bit about that later on, and they said, well, yeah, see, we're not allowed to have Bibles, and uh, so we try to memorize Scripture. Sometimes we even get when we're in jail. Nothing else to do. We'll just memorize Scripture, right? He said, wait a minute, you're not allowed to have a Bible in jail, are you? Well, no, but somebody will come and they'll have written, you know, a chapter of the Bible or something like that, and they'll smuggle it in, and when we get a chance, we'll commit it to memory. And he's like, well, what if you get caught with that? They said, that's why we got to memorize it as fast as we can, because then they can, cause they can take that away. And they can punish us, but they can't take it out of our head and out of our heart. So they memorize large portions of Scripture, right? And they're meeting. They're on fire for the Lord. Uh, they're winning people kind of secretively, but winning people to the Lord. And, it, and before the preacher left, he said, what would you like me to, uh, to pray for you guys? I'm about to leave. He said, but what would you like me to pray for you? And they said, you guys get to assemble, you know, freely worship freely, read the Bible, do all those things freely. That's what we want to do. Would you just pray that we could be more like you guys? And he said, no, I can't pray that. He said, you see, in America, you know, you guys, you guys here will walk, you know, 12 miles to get to church. In America, if they got to drive more than a half hour, they're not going to go. He said, you guys uh, are doing everything you can to memorize scripture. You're not even allowed to have the scripture. In America, everybody's got two or more Bibles at home and they don't read any of them. You can assemble, you guys assemble whenever you can and, and, and they just don't assemble, you know, for the silliest reasons. And he went down this list of all the things wrong with Christianity in America and he said, I cannot pray that you'll be more like us. In fact, I'm going to pray that we'll be more like you. Now, in order to say that, we have to say, well, are, am I willing to suffer that type of persecution so that I'll actually get on fire and do something for the Lord? That's a hard prayer to pray. But we can see that the churches in China, you can ask Brother Lawman, you can ask a lot of missionaries, will tell you, even though they're secretive and they're not allowed to announce it, uh, all the pre many preachers that have been part of that kind of underground uh, stuff there says it's growing like crazy. It's just spreading People are on fire. They don't care if they're getting thrown in jail. Uh, I mean, they don't care. They're trying not to get thrown in jail, but, you know, hey, uh, I got to do what God told me to do. Look real quickly at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 24. Now, 
Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one, one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom we put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. By the way, that's what they were put in prison for doing. They said to stop preaching. And so then they were thrown in jail. And then they came out and they said, Hey, those guys that you put in prison, they're out there standing in the temple preaching. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence for the fear of the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with all your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. And so they continued to preach. Throw me in jail if you want. I'm going to continue to preach. And that's hard. And you would say, yeah, but we don't really have that problem in America. Well, you know, there are people. I hear stories of people being arrested for preaching the gospel where they were told they're not allowed to preach the gospel. And all you got to do is move up a little bit north. And I heard that just recently people in Canada getting arrested for street preaching and doing different things. And look, I didn't look them all up and see exactly what it entailed, but I'm telling you right now in our society, it is increasing exponentially. If you say something about homosexuality online, you're going to be censored. I may ask Brother Dan. <laughs> He's got his Facebook account shut off. Uh, preachers. If they, have a, if they have record of them preaching against homosexuality, banned from entering in other countries. You say, oh, well, that won't happen in America. Well, here's the thing. I'm not, yeah, I don't care to criticize Trump or agree with him or anything, but I remember when he took over the office, uh, one of the things he did on June, Obama, man, June was just, they had the rainbow uh, lights all over the White House and all that kind of stuff. And when Trump got in there, he said, we're not going to do that. And he took away a lot of the stuff online that the White House had about the LGBT uh, community. And he took, the, took that off. And a lot of Christians said, hey, that's great. Trump's not going to stand for homosexuality, you know, being so mainstream. I mean, look, we're talking about 3% of America. And you would think it's like every other person, the way people try to make it so normalized. And then, you know, of course, not too long ago, they legalized the marriage uh, situation, the same-sex marriage. And so, uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of people thought, hey, you know, Trump's not going to put up with this kind of stuff. But I started noticing they were sending uh, ambassadors from our country to all these other countries. And these ambassadors that they were sending were homosexuals. And they were sending them to countries, and these countries were against homosexuality. And I thought, why would he be doing that? What's the agenda here? So this June, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, I don't really keep up with the news very well, but somebody can maybe back me up on this. If this June, he made a public announcement saying, you know, praising the LGBT community and saying this month that we recognize them and said something along the lines of, I, I need to look up this quote, you know, and maybe I'll share it with you another time because I don't want to go on record saying something that's incorrect. But if I'm not mistaken, he said that our goal is to stop worldwide the criminal, criminal criminalization of the LGBT community. In other words, there are other countries that are still um, uh, punishing people who are involved in sodomy, right? They go back to the Bible, the, uh, the Muslims go to the Quran and, and what have you, and they say, hey, this is, we're not going to tolerate this. We make laws against uh, homosexuality. So the United States of America has said, well, here, we're going to, we're going to save the world. We're going to make sure that they're not allowed to be criminalized anymore. So what I'm saying is this, there's this agenda. Don't let anybody fool you into thinking there's not an agenda. There's this agenda to just legalize it everywhere and to make sure that the whole world embraces it. And Christians more than ever, I mean, you just look around. If you don't believe me, you know, just wait a couple months. You'll see it increase more. Wait a couple years. Who knows what's going to be next? You know, 
But if no one's saying anything about it and they're just saying, oh, yeah, well, we just better, you know, be quiet, let the government put these laws in place and, and allow this to go on or whatever. And, oh, they don't want us to preach about it. We better just be quiet about it and we better shut up about it. No, no, no. The Bible says to preach the whole counsel of God. And when, guy, and when kings all throughout the Bible took over a land and they were good godly kings and there were sodomites in the land, they got them out, right? And so now we have, we have uh, uh, preachers, even Baptist preachers, I heard, in, in endorsing, you know, let's not criticize, you know, let's, uh, uh, let's even ordain. If I'm not mistaken, some Baptist preachers are now ordaining uh, uh, same set, whatever, whatever you call uh, preachers to be able to preach that, that are okay with this. And you say, why are you bringing all that up? I'm just telling you where our society is. Uh, abortion is another thing. It's increasingly unpopular to talk about. Now, in our circles, there's still enough Christians that are still like, okay, well, abortion, we can go preach about abortion. Just don't preach about those other things. But abortion is still wrong, so we need to preach about abortion. Yeah, but there's going to come a time where we can't say anything about abortion. You know, again, there are countries banning people because they're going to come in and try to change our mind on abortion, right? And so, uh, so I'm saying that if you think that, oh, laws aren't made to hold Christians back. Yeah, they are. And you know who's behind it is Satan. Satan wants this to happen. We know, look, we read the Bible. Uh, we know what's coming. We know that uh, laws are going to be made that Christians are forced to disobey. And then laws are going to be made to judge Christians that disobey those laws. And those laws are going to send them to jail. Those laws are going to shut down their churches. Those laws are going to do all those things. You say, well, you're so negative. Why are you thinking that way? Look, I'm just telling you, uh, just read the Bible. <laughs> Look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And so anyway, I, 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 for the sake of time, I'm going to try to speed up uh, the last little section here. But so... Haman, you know, is now uh, obsessed with persecuting Jews and persecuting Mordecai uh, to the point where he, he gets the king of Ahasuerus to make a decree that all the Jews can be killed. He doesn't know Esther's a Jew, and he doesn't know the whole motive behind Haman doing this. He just trusts Haman and says, sure, I'll make the law, law of the Medes and the Persians, right? So Mordecai gets this word, and he's just terrified. Rips his clothes. I don't know why they did that. They went through a lot of clothes back then. <laughs> but every time they got mad, they ripped their clothes. And clothes were expensive and not easy to fix back then. <laughs> and so they would do that, or they'd sit in ashes or pull their hair or whatever. But anyway, they, uh, uh, he was grieved, and he published all throughout the land, hey, this is what they're doing. A uh, decree's been signed that they can kill the Jews, and uh, the word gets to Esther and all that. You know how the story goes, Okay. Is that ever going to happen in our country where Christians are going to be persecuted? Well, look at Mark chapter 13. I, I do realize that some will teach that this isn't talking about uh, Christians. I believe it is. Okay, so look at Mark 13 verse 5. And Jesus answering them, he's talking to his disciples, uh, began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am, Christ, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be, not, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. But take heed to yourself, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sakes for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither be uh, ye premeditate. But whatsoever uh, shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it, shall, uh, it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now, the brother shall betray the brother to death. And the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 
Saved from what? Saved from the wrath of God. Right? What do you mean endure to the end? Endure to the rapture. Right? That's what I believe is saying there. And then those people that endure and make it to a lot of a lot of people will die. You know, we might be dead before that ha happens. I understand that, but I'm saying a lot of people even during, before that time might die. But it says when that those who are alive, those who endured to the end, the same shall be saved. They're going to be raptured up before the uh, wrath of God is poured out. And so anyway, uh, so you say, what? Why did you? Why did you bring that verse up? Because you notice this, he's not just saying the whole world hates you. The whole world is going to want to put you in jail. The whole world is going to want to persecute you and all this kind of stuff. But he's saying your own brothers are going to deliver you up. Your own family members are going to turn on each other. Well, how are we ever going to come to that point? Because we know it's coming, right? And I'm not trying to depress everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying we know it's coming. So how is it going to get there? Well, you just connect the dots and you can see what's going to happen. The society is going to push more and more for Christians to be silent about things. And some Christians aren't going to be silent. And the other ones are going to say, sure, you need to quit. You need to shut your mouth. You're going to get us in trouble. And he's going to say, hey, I, I got to do what God tells me to do. And they're going to say, he said it. Take him to jail. I didn't say it. <laughs> you can see how that's going to happen, right? So just like we have in the time Haman hated the Jews. There's always wicked people that hate God's people. Okay? And he hated God's people, and he said, they're not obeying me, they're not bowing down to me, I can't move them. Uh, just like they did Daniel, just like they did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like uh, wicked people always do to men of God. We need to kill them, we need to persecute them, we need to shut them up, we need to stop them. And they say, hey, I, I, I got to obey God rather than men. Now the last part is the best part, but I don't, I'm not going to take a lot of time, and I didn't even have a whole lot to say about it anyway. But the last part is this, that laws are also made. We see this all throughout Scripture. We see this all throughout history. Uh, you think about uh, times where evil men led, like, even during World War or whatever, and they killed lots of people and did all that. And you say, hey, how could this wickedness go on? Laws are made occasionally that destroy the wicked people, right, and glorify God's people. But I'm going to tell you this, I don't see that happening very much in our world, okay? But there's coming a time, all right? There's coming a time Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth. There's coming a time where all the laws are going to be laws that honor and glorify God and magnify his people. And are, quite honestly, all those who are saved are going to have a part in enforcing those laws. And I don't know who's all going to be populated in the world. That's another story for another time. But those people, if they're wicked, you know, those laws are going to be in place that glorify God and glorify righteousness and they glorify God's people and they stop the wickedness in this world. And the world then goes to a wonderful place. A wonderful place where uh, are very much like the uh, the times of guard of, of back in the garden, you know, just wonderful time before the flood and all that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, so all throughout the Bible, we see this here in Esther right now, but I could take you to so many other places where we see the same principle, right? Godly people being persecuted, the whole world getting evil. God saves His people out of out of that wickedness. Gets them through it at least, not without persecution, not without suffering, but he gets them through it. Then he pours out his wrath upon the wickedness. I just over and over, almost every page, <laughs> right? We see that's how God works. So in dealing with laws in our society, hey, if they don't hurt you, you know, obey them. Obey those who have the authority over you and all that. We, we get it. But if there's a law that tells you to do something con con that contradicts what the Bible says, don't be afraid of man, right? Just do what God says. Fear God more than man, and he'll get you through, right, to the other side. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word and for the encouragement. Uh, it could have been uh, somewhat of a discouraging message, just thinking about the times that we're going to go through and all this. But over and over, uh, we're encouraged in the word to just think about your coming. And to think about the fact that you have the last say and that you have the, all the authority, the final authority over all things. And, and Lord, we just trust you. We just continue in faith to do the work you called us to and try to live right 
try to live righteous and holy in this wicked world. And certainly we mess up. Certainly we fall into wickedness. Certainly we fail in so many areas, Lord. But help us just keep on getting back up and getting right with you and following you and trying to have a good testimony for you so that the, your kingdom will be established and it will grow. Uh, the word will, uh, your word will grow and many people will be saved. It's, uh, it's the, the, whole, the gospel will be preached throughout the whole world, Lord. Help us to do that. Help us to accomplish that as, as your uh, as uh, your people. I pray you be honored and glorified in the end and that your kingdom will come, Lord, as it is in heaven, so it will be on earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.